Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Zubin Austin, and welcome to today's CPE rounds for the Center for Practice Excellence. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our virtual rounds. Today's topic is negotiating a role for pharmacists in primary care teams. I'm pleased to introduce our presenter for today, Dr. Jennifer Lake. Jennifer has been a lecturer at the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy, University of Toronto since 2010. Her current teaching responsibilities are pharmacotherapy in primary care as part of the PharmD for Pharmacists program. She has also been teaching at the Faculty of Medicine here at the University of Toronto since 2016 and was recently appointed as the lead of the pharmacology pharmacotherapy stream for undergraduate medical education starting in 2018. Her educational interests are collaborative learning, applied learning, pharmacy practice and primary care. Jennifer has extensive clinical experience in both hospital and primary care environments, and most recently she worked at the Southeast Toronto Family Health Team. Her primary care experiences impacted her immensely, including the value that pharmacists can actually bring to primary care, which is why she returned to complete her, her PhD. It is my pleasure to welcome Jennifer to today's presentation. If I could ask you to please hold questions until the end of the presentation, as we normally do with these rounds, we have a discussant who I will introduce shortly after the presentation, Dorette Cheng, who will be providing our first round of analysis questions and interactions with our speaker. With that, let me introduce Jennifer and enjoy today's presentation. Jennifer, over to you. Thanks, Subhan. And thanks to everybody who's online. Um, I'm really excited to be doing this and thank you for taking the time. This is really the first time I've gotten to share my PhD work more widely than my committee. And so it's, it's really exciting for me. This isn't necessarily how I was expecting to share it, but that really is an analogy for my PhD. Everything has been unexpected. Um, a short agenda. I'll be doing a short introduction and research methods. If you're interested in my research methods and want more information, please uh, ask questions at the end or get in touch with me. I'm happy to talk about them. The majority of the talk will be about the initial results because I think that's the most exciting part and sort of how I see the step forwards and where my research is going. First, I'd like to do a big thank you to my committee members, Zubin Austin, Jan Barnsley, and Alicia Lofters, who have been the steady guiding hand to get me through the last few years of this research, as well as the members of the teams who actually participated in my research. They made it a really enjoyable um, experience for me. So I became interested in this topic because when people were practicing in primary care as a pharmacist, the roles were different. People weren't doing the same things. And this is because roles are dynamic and they're created by complex interactions of lots of factors. Who's doing the role, what the job description is in that specific context, who else is in the team, and in healthcare specifically, who the patients you're servicing are and what their needs are. Healthcare is being delivered in team settings in many different places, but specifically in primary care. In many jurisdictions, primary care is expanding and including pharmacists on their teams. And despite being the third largest group of healthcare professionals, we're under-researched in most healthcare settings and specifically in primary care. So what I wanted to look at was, why do certain people do this role in a primary care team versus in another team, they do something different? Also, in the evidence that is out there, there is some evidence that pharmacists can struggle to participate fully in teams, and why is that? So my research question is, how is the role of a pharmacist negotiated in Ontario family health teams? I wanna give you some language around what that means to me in my research. A role is what the pharmacist does on a daily basis, the responsibilities and tasks that are under their purview in that organization. A role is very context specific. So it's about what that person did in that team. A primary care team is an interdisciplinary organization providing primary care services. I looked at family health teams in Ontario because they're the most prevalent family health team, their most prevalent primary care team in Ontario, and they're the most likely to have hired pharmacists. Negotiation. I want to sort of spend a little bit of time on this because it's a little different than how we use it in sort of everyday language. We think about negotiating as what we do in order to get a better salary, get better vacation, an office. 
Negotiation in my research is how people or organizations influence the role. It's the everyday actions we take to navigate situations. So I want to sort of give you an example. Let's think about you being the Prime Minister of Canada. You're at a meeting with all of the other G7 leaders and you have to sit down and talk to a leader. And this one, the first time, it's your best friend. It's the person that you're used to sharing lots of values with. When you shake hands for that photo op, you lean in, there's a genuine smile, you do a little bit of chit chat. Now, you're at the same meeting and now you have to shake hands with the leader, well, who maybe you don't like so much. And you lean back, there's no eye contact, and you fake a smile. This is actually negotiation. We all do it every day. It's how we navigate everyday situations. And it doesn't matter what the situation is, we always have three endpoints. The endpoints are, for negotiations, we want to achieve a goal. So we all have personal goals, and that may be what we're trying to negotiate towards. When we're talking about working in a healthcare team, we also might be trying to achieve an organization goal. We'll often call this a strategic goal. Or we might be trying to negotiate towards a ministry goal. Because we're in a publicly funded system, the ministry has specific goals that they mandate. And so the negotiation might be trying to achieve that goal. So these are all about goal achievement. The second outcome that you might be trying to negotiate is the creation of a shared experience or vision. This one's a little bit harder to kind of think about, but if you think that we all work with other people around us, whether they be in a formal organization or just the people we work with every day, we all like to present the best face to either our patients, our consumers, the ministry. And so an example might be a primary care team who whose vision is to provide outreach to underserved populations. That's their shared vision. So they might be negotiating to ensure that everything that they do in their everyday aligns with that vision. The last one is the, it's really important and it's probably the one we don't think about as often and that's maintaining harmony. So lots of times when we're negotiating everyday situations, we actually choose not to do things or we choose what we'll do in order to maintain the status quo or not upset the people around us. And it's important to think about this as we think about negotiating a role because potentially this is where sort of that turf comes in. Maybe we don't negotiate a specific task or responsibility because we know it's going to rock the boat. So as we think about negotiating, it is as simple as negotiating is what we do in order to sort of make life move forward. So how did I do the research? So I invited 17 teams to participate. I took um, 17 teams that had publicly available emails from the 111 teams that have a pharmacist practicing in them. Uh, Gillespie and all published in the Canadian Pharmacy Journal recently about what tasks family health teams did. I tried to maintain a similar demographic. So they had about three quarters women pharmacists, one quarter men, mostly Canadian trained. I tried to invite 17 teams that sort of looked like that. I had five teams that agreed to be part of it. In order to be part of it, both the pharmacist and the executive director had to independently agree to be part of it. And the reason is, is the executive director was considered to be the custodian of the team. Their okay allowed me to be, come into the team. And the pharmacist was at a higher risk than other people within the research because we're talking about their role. So that from a research point of view, they could be coerced by the executive director to participate and I didn't want that. So I minimized that by having them both agree to independently do it. Then when I got to the teams, they had to suggest more participants to interview. I needed the executive director, the pharmacist, at least one physician and at least one other interview and up to four other interviews. Two of the teams didn't complete because I didn't get enough interviews. So I ended up with having three cases, A, B, and C. Um, and this was okay because I'm doing a multiple case study. I'll talk about that a little more in the next slide. 
but three is actually quite common for multiple case studies, and I'd actually kept all five teams with hopes of being able to maintain three stuck cases. So I, my recruitment strategy did a good job. Qualitative methods on one slide. Again, if you want more information, please don't hesitate to ask at the end. So I'm doing a multiple case study as per yin. Yin, there are a couple ways to do case studies, but the big factors that when you do it as per yin are that you need to have multiple types of data. And I'm using both interview and documents. You have to have some hypothesis about why things might happen so that you can prove or disprove those hypotheses as you're doing the analysis. The third thing is, is that each case study is treated as a single experiment, and then you do an overall experiment across all case studies to see if that you can predict similarities or predict differences based on what you had hypothesized. And so in actuality, I have three different experiments, A, B, and C, and then I'll have a cross case experiment. I did interviews, I did both on-site and telephone interviews. I did them with a semi-structured guide that I created based on the pre-existing knowledge around some of these concepts, as well as I did two pilots with people who were in teams that I wouldn't be able to recruit. For documents, I requested documents from the team, but as well I took publicly available documents from both their website, Health Quality Ontario or HQO, and the APTO website, which is the Associations of Family Health Teams of Ontario. So when you start to do qualitative analysis, I did mine using the Quagall, which is actually an interpretive th thematic analysis, which means I'm doing more than describing, I'm actually trying to dig deeper and interpret why things are happening. Um, the reason that I chose Quagall is it's not actually centered in a specific qualitative background. And because I didn't come from a sociology or psychology background, that's why. So basically, the timeline sort of looks, you hand code your interview, then you take those hand codings and you do an overview of concepts and you create a coding frame. You verify that frame with other people. In my case, it was my committee. And then once you agree that those are the sort of coding words, you put your interviews into your software. I'm using MaxQDA, another common one is in vivo, um, but I'm using MaxQDA. And then you recode based on that coding frame. You then get a bunch of quotes that are coded and you start to read those codes. And then you start to theme. And in my case, you theme and then you verify with your supervisor and then you go back and you retheme. And you basically do these last two steps on a cycle for a long time. And as a novice qualitative researcher, you do it a little bit longer than other people. So this is sort of how I did everything. So what you're gonna see today is actually case A and B. Case C is going to start being analyzed the next week. And then once I do all three cases, I'll do the cross case comparison. So what's happening? And so, here, how negotiation is happening in my cases is there are sort of two aspects, an individual aspect, the pharmacist aspect, and that really is best characterized by professional identity. Professional identity in my research is a social construct. And what I mean by that is that it isn't just what the pharmacist feels a pharmacist is or does, it's actually what the team and society and the organization think. It's interactional. And how I'm doing this in my research is by a sociologist named Goffman, and he uses an analogy of the person doing their professional identity is what they present outwards. And so they describe the individual as an actor and the people who are seeing what's presented outwards as the audience. I want to assure everybody that I am not saying that anybody is doing falsehoods or acting as their identity. It's just an analogy of a way to understand that there is a connection between how the pharmacist presents themselves and how the audience interprets it. And that interaction is really important because if there's a disconnect there, 
if there's a disconnect between what the pharmacist thinks they're presenting and how it's being interpreted, that's gonna impact negotiation. And so an example of this is, I was I asked a pharmacist to describe a conflict. And when they described the conflict, at the end they said, well, I basically walked away and I told my boss and I made my boss deal with it. And the pharmacist thought this was professional because they didn't create any more conflict on top of what was already happening. But when the boss was asked for how they interpreted it, they actually thought that the pharmacist negated their responsibility to the team and the team member by not dealing with it in the moment. And so this is a good example of how a social construct of the exact same thing is interpreted differently. The second aspect of negotiation is, is the organizational attributes. And for my research, this really is best characterized by managerialism. And managerialism is a healthcare philosophy. This happened about 30 or 40 years ago in healthcare. And it's really where it started to be thought that healthcare could be managed like a business. That if we put structures and procedures and accountability in, that healthcare could be managed better more efficiently, less costly, bending the curve. And so in Ontario, this has been the major philosophy for healthcare delivery since about the 1990s. And so one of the things that managerial does is it shifts the balance of power between clinicians, mostly doctors, who really drove what happened in healthcare before this, and managers and patients. And in primary care, the aspects of managerialism that are sort of common in every day are quality improvement and the reliance on that as the backbone of change, patient-centeredness and making the patient that stakeholder and using metrics and incentivizing specific metrics and that's accountability. And so these organizational attributes start to impact the negotiation. So how you can see negotiating the role in a family health team is this balance or push and pull of the pharmacist best characterized by their professional identity and the organization best characterized whether they have implemented managerialism or not. So as we move on to my cases, these are sort of the two things I'll come back to. So case A, in case A, the negotiation was happenstance sort of across all of the interviews, there weren't any really great examples of people negotiating sort of change. Change sort of happened because, well, it just sort of happened. Nobody planned for it. And a quote here from the executive director is about the pharmacist and they support patients with med reviews. They look after those and they see them face to face or they just follow up with phone consults. And they keep themselves busy, but I think they think the role could be much more than it presently is, and it probably can. So this is an important quote, and it sort of fits negotiation being happenstance, because this is an executive director who has some power in the system and leadership, saying that I think the pharmacist thinks their role is not so great, and I think it probably could be more, but nothing's actually happening to change the circumstance. And really the role of the pharmacist was based on referral patterns. It was driven by the physician need. And the physician described it as, well, I think they do, the pharmacist, a lot of sort of background work for us. You know, making sure that the patient's medications are up to date and making sure lab work is done so we can have a fulsome discussion. So very supportive about, well, their job is to make my day go a little bit smoother. The professional identity of the pharmacist, and this was described by both the pharmacist and the other participants, was really supportive and about an access to information or medication knowledge. And I have a quote from the pharmacist talking about, I think from the physician's perspective, they appreciate that I'm doing phone call follow-ups. They do have a nurse who calls, but if it's drug related, they know it's just better for me to have that conversation. And then the physician talked about I mean their knowledge base on medications, their ability to quickly look up information regarding medications, their interactions with medications, side effects. I think the biggest thing is their knowledge is really, really vast and a good resource for a clinic. So this really talks about the pharmacist as being a way to access medication information or knowledge quickly. 
this organization didn't have a strong implementation of managerialism. It was demonstrated that it was a weaker implementation by high medical dominance, low resource optimization, and low attainment of ministry stated goals. I the two quotes here really to talk about medical dominance. And the executive director says, are there physicians out there taking shots at us? Absolutely, which really also ticks me off. You know, it's easy to sit back and tell people they're not doing a good job, especially if you're not helping them to try to do a good <coughs> job. And then on the other side, when asked about if the physicians are equal users of the pharmacist services, the physician said, I mean, I don't really, you know, we kind of all do our own thing. One of the things that's interesting as you start to talk about organizations and medical dominance is one of the attributes of medical dominance is the actual ability to have a choice of whether you want to engage or not in the system. And so you'll see that that ability to have power to say, well, I'm just going to do what I want to do is really an attribute of a high medical dominance. So I want to give you an example of a failed negotiation. And in this case, the pharmacist had a personal goal that they wanted to implement a medication reconciliation program. There were no metrics or goals set for the program. They just said, I want to do this. Everybody sort of went, okay, didn't rock the boat because nobody else was doing it. But nobody showed up. Patients didn't attend. Because there was no metrics or goals, nobody went back to debrief of, well, what went wrong? And the stakeholders all sort of said, well, it was a nice thought, good try. And then they moved on as the program was deemed to be not valuable or essential. There was no learning from it. This is an example of a failed negotiation when you're starting to think about how come this failed. And I'm going to get you to hold there because we're going to talk about it a little bit going forward as we do case B. So in case B, negotiation was top down. It was driven by the organization. And a good example of this is the executive director talked about, we've completely revamped some areas. All of a specific clinical area has been completely revamped. One of the criteria I think that everybody can agree on is that if a service is already provided in the community, we can probably back off from that. And so this is now you're talking about negotiating not only within the team, but now sort of viewing things in a larger system. The pharmacist role was viewed as a resource or a tool to provide services to both the patients and the organization. There's been a lot of debate about condition A, which the pharmacist currently manages. A lot of debate about the options, but we also have a community pharmacist downstairs who's happy to do more. And as you know, the scope of that position has grown over the last 10 years. So you can see here that we're starting to look at the pharmacist role. Yes, they're doing condition A, but is that the best use of their time? So the professional identity of the pharmacist in this case, the participants, including the pharmacist, describe themselves as supportive, a team player, and an educator. And the physician quote here really goes over sort of those materials. However, the pharmacist specifically described themselves as looking for direction. And so basically, this was a quote about a program that, that the pharmacist had become involved in. And I said to physician number five, the lead of the program, what is the most important part of my job? And he said meta optimization. And basically I went, okay, this is what I look at. And so there were several quotes about the pharmacist looking for direction. Implementation of managerialism, which based on what I've sort of said earlier, I think you can see in the quotes, was very high in this organization. Participants questioned value and resource utilization. And I'm using value in quotes because I haven't well characterized it in my thesis, but I will. It will be the up and coming discussion. Um, value is an important term. And so here, another interprofessional healthcare provider within the team said, in the past, we've been getting a lot of referrals for filling out forms. It was something that takes a lot of time. It's not necessarily our best role. I mean, we're limited with our time here. And so members of this team were meant to think about how their role contributed to the larger group. Although medical dominance was described by all participants, either as decision-making or engagement, 
there was a more concerted effort in this team to limit the power. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. But here, the pharmacist said, everything goes back to the physician. Basically, I say to the doctor, hey, what about this? And they may say, let's increase it. Can the nurse have them back in two weeks? But the docs, our docs are very much like they want to be the ones to make the changes. This is the physician. Obviously, we get a report back on the day the pharmacist sees the patient. Depending on the circumstances, I might call the patient or the nurse might, and we talk about stopping a medication or changing something. Probably more commonly, I would see that patient in the office again to go over things. These quotes were given in different interviews, but you can see that they're very aligned. It's how the team views this relationship. So back to the medication reconciliation program example. In this team, a medication reconciliation program was suggested. Both a pharmacist and one physician wanted it. It was their personal goals. They saw it as something that would bring value. In this team, it was reviewed and passed through a central committee. That committee approved it, and because of that approval, it became an organizational goal. It's an organizational goal, so metrics were created and submitted to the Ministry of Health, the funder. Then a pilot was created with the committed physician's population, and improvements to that initial program were done, and the FIT, the FIT renewed its con commitment to this medication reconciliation program. It submitted the metrics again, and again, this cycle starts. So here, the personal goal of the pharmacist was able to capitalize on organizational structures in order to have a successful negotiation. And this is because there were alignments between the pharmacist, they found a physician who held some power, or at least had enough interest that was able to. They had a committee where that starts to align this program with does it fit in our vision <coughs> and because there were metrics people were able to improve it and people saw value in it so in summary the results from my third case and cross case are still pending but the first two cases in both cases the pharmacist saw their role as supportive i would say in case a it was more technical and knowledge-based, and in case B, it was more as a resource to provide patient care activities to inform and support care. So my initial results demonstrate that in fits with pharmacists who have defined their role as supportive, the organization becomes essential in negotiating the roles. Strong managerialism supports more patient-facing roles and may be a policy lever. So the importance of my research is really that we should be able to come up with policy and educational recommendations to improve the role of the pharmacist in primary care. If pharmacists and their team members define the role as supportive and strong implementation of managerial means role changes, we should be able to create clear programmatic structures with tasks and outcomes to be implemented. This basically means that the health system, as a policy, should be able to have pharmacy program in a box. Here is the box, implement it, and it'll likely be implemented, and things will move forward. Where my thesis will is still sort of investigating is if a different professional identity is required, if supportive isn't really the best identity to negotiate, Will educational changes support that, either in undergrad or as continuing professional development? Can we do continuing professional development that starts to give people skills to negotiate a role or provides them the opportunity to view their identity differently? I don't know. And my data right now isn't going in that direction. Um, it may as I move on to the next case and cross case. But what I will leave you with is a quote of the day. And if you follow me on Twitter, this won't surprise you that I end this way. Everything is negotiable. Whether or not the negotiation is easy is another question. Thank you. And I'm happy to talk to Durette now. Well, thank you very much, Jen. Um, I'll ask Durette to please turn her camera on so that everybody can see her. 
And in a few minutes, we will uh, turn it over to Dorette to uh, be our discussant for today. A little introduction about Dorette. Um, as many of you know already, Dorette Cheng is a lecturer here at the Leslie Dent Faculty of Pharmacy, as well as a clinical pharmacist at St. Michael's Hospital Academic Family Health Team. She first joined community pharmacy practice in Edmonton and became one of the first pharmaceutical care specialists in that province. After obtaining her PharmD from the University of Toronto, she spent 10 years in inpatient care at Mount Sinai. And I personally had the pleasure of working with Dorette for those 10 years. The opportunity to have worked in a variety of different settings has offered her insights on the value of collaboration, communication, and advocacy for vulnerable populations, especially during transitions in care. I'll turn it over to Dorette now to offer her reflections and to begin questioning uh, around the presentation. Dorette. Thank you. Um, thank you, Zubin. Thank you, Jennifer, for um, this uh, thesis that you have developed. And it's, it's so important to delve into the qualitative issues around how we as pharmacists um, function within the larger um, uh, medical system and how we can better um, sort of evaluate what our role is and what are some of the key things that need, we need to be aware of. So qualitative um, studies like yours are, are so important. And uh, I was just really excited to be able to kind of have this opportunity to kind of um, see what project you were working on and the results of it. Um, but also, um, you know, I'm, I'm humbled by the fact that I, you know, have been given this opportunity to engage in this way. Um, I joined family practice um, about three years ago um, after having done the other types of roles within the other types of settings that I've been. So um, I really do feel strongly that pharmacists in primary care, it's the sweet spot. And I'm, I'm very passionate about it. And um, I think that uh, your, um, the results of your, your thesis will really give us some some fodder to um, things to work on. Um, I think I have three reflections that I wanted to um, sort of uh, talk about. Number one was negotiating the role. Um, I think, you know, everybody with, who is currently working within um, primary care and family practice has a slightly different take, right? Um, I have to caveat this by telling you that I work in a very strong academic center, um, St. Mike's, which um, currently uh, has about six family health um, sites, right? And about 70 physicians. I have two other pharmacist colleagues that I work with, Brenda Chang and John Hunchuk. And um, in my setting, you know, I'm biased, right? Because I have two other pharmacist colleagues that I can work with and also bounce ideas off of. But um, I think interestingly enough, when I first joined family practice, I still had to negotiate my role despite, um, because in, in, in even in every single clinic, um, there's complexities and variations in how people practice and what the relationships are like. And um, so I think that number one, um, one of the key things that I remember um, needing to negotiate was really to develop trust. And that trust um, was uh, first and foremost could only be developed with me having FaceTime with the, uh, with the clinicians. And um, that meant that I had to really negotiate where I would be situated within the clinics, right? So that was number one. Um, FaceTime because with more FaceTime came more opportunities to converse and opportunities to collaborate. And with this FaceTime, it also allowed um, opportunities for me to demonstrate what my knowledge and what my skills were. So that was, that was one of the first things. And um, in developing this trust, I noticed that there were um, a few things that were key. Um, number one was, um, flexibility. <laughs> Number two was um, really not um, bending on the patient-centeredness part and the advocacy for our patients and that everybody owns this patient, not just the physician, um, and to take responsibility 
for all of the recommendations that I was making by following through, following up, um, without having the physician um, sort of have to prompt me. Um, so offering that up firsthand. Um, so that's my first, and, and, and that takes some confidence, right? That I think that if you are a new practitioner, that can be a bit challenging. I'm old. <laughs> I've been in pharmacy practice for a long time. So I think that that came a little bit easier because I failed a lot already. And so I've learned from a lot of my failures. And, and so I think having the confidence was um, helpful too, to be able to negotiate what it is that your, your role is. And um, I guess that also um, touches upon and uh, number two, um, what you mentioned was professional identity. And again, confidence plays a big role in the, in the professional identity as well, because we really need to know who we are and who we are as a profession is very, very sort of uh, constructed through um, how we're socialized within our profession. I think if I compare ourselves to the medical profession, the medical profession is very early on socialized to be leaders and managers and um, to be to take charge of the patient's care decisions. Um, whereas I think that um, uh, our profession, we lag behind in that in that sense. So it goes to really um, where we balance ourselves in the supportive role versus the leader role and the managerial role. And that again takes experience and it takes um, some so socialization. And I always wonder whether or not that needs to happen and it probably should happen earlier on, um, not only in our educational institutes, um, but also within our professional organizations, our colleges, um, our advocacy associations, OPA. Um, and I think we often, because we haven't socialized or haven't been able to be socialized um, early on to take leadership roles and decision-making roles, um, we, tend to, we tend to lag behind in that. So I, I wanted to kind of express that. And then, and then thirdly, um, I, I think that um, it, it, what you mentioned about quality and patient-centeredness is very, very key. Right, because as we start moving towards, well, how can we take a larger role? Um, I think that that um, those two things can be key drivers um, in helping us to be more confident and more um, apt to be taking more leadership. Um, it's we know what our role is. We know what we can do, whether it comes to um, medication assessments and safety, but other people have not seen it they may not have been experienced with it. And so I think that it's, it's gonna take some time to, to do that. How do we do the right thing? Well, I think we, we do need to take um, more leadership and, and decision-making roles. And that needs to be, again, um, uh, done in a collaborative way and to be communicated to the powers that be that can make help advocate for our profession, um, partnering with the right stakeholders, whether it's locally or at the executive level, and number two, at the government level, um, what kind of advocacy work needs to be done. Another thing that I, I, um, I feel very strongly about that I wonder, um, Jennifer, is um, whether or not you had opportunity to really um, delve into what the relationship was between um, family health team pharmacists embedded in a, in a clinical setting such as a, a inpatient care there versus a, and, and versus a community pharmacist and whether or not that network, that, that relationship um, requires some also qualitative work um, when it comes to that. Because um, in my own experience, I find that patient care is that much better when I have um, liaised in a constructive way with our community pharmacist colleagues um, and, and even pharmacy technician colleagues. Um, I have a bunch of um, pharmacies that are in our area 
that I, um, I work very closely with. And when I have a good relationship with them, there is, um, it's so much more fruitful when it comes to patient care. Um, and I, 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 I wonder whether or not there was any um, uh, sort of commentary about that, because I noticed that in one of your quotes is like, well, the community pharmacist does this and the, the, the scope of practice is expanding. So to me, sometimes, um, because I'm limited sometimes by the hospital act and my scope within the hospital setting, uh, academic hospital setting, um, what I can do for the patient, I need to extend that by engaging the community pharmacist. So yeah, so um, there was absolutely discussion about how the teams partnered with community pharmacists in some, in some respects. Um, specifically the one case B which looked at sort of external things um, and what was being delivered um, they seem to have more of a focus than case A did um, I I would love I would love so I did a PhD looking at family health teams specifically because there is a formal there should be a formal re relationship and there is a value and a cost to having a pharmacist in a team. I didn't do community pharmacists and primary care physicians or nurse practitioners, primary care providers, um, because the weak link ties are a little bit harder to find um, and I wanted to get a PhD done. So I did a family health team only, uh, but I would love to do that. And anybody giving up money to do that later, I will completely take it from you. Um, for around the relationships and developing trust, one of the things I didn't mention so I didn't do people that were in their first year. I, year was what my inclusion criteria did. I actually, on average, the people that I or my teams were above five years in their practice. So they should have developed relationships if they were going to develop. And I think that that's sort of one of the disconnects that I made an assumption um, and this is one of the limitations is um, I made an assumption that people who were in their roles for longer would have had more negotiation because it would have changed over time. That is what I assumed. Um, and that isn't the case. Um, lots of people had very few changes from start to where they were. Um, and that's, that is very telling and there's, and there's data about that, which I won't delve into because it's not at the tip of my fingers. But um, I didn't try to do integration, which would, I was sort of deeming as that first year because it's been done by the impact researchers and as well as a couple other jurisdictions. I was really trying to look at people who are already in the team, what happens? Why do things change? Um, I think confidence is a really interesting phenomenon um, and something I'd like to look in more later. Um, I think that there's lots of people who say, I'm not confident, but I don't know how to get them there. And that's sort of anecdotally from being in the PharmD for pharmacists and having lots of students who are practicing pharmacists. Um, so I think confidence is an interesting thing. From a professional identity point of view about the comparison of what a pharmacist and a physician are, which Jamie Keller is probably on there and like going, don't talk about it. Um, <laughs> Dubin talks about it that way too. I actually, in, in my theory of how I look at professional identity, I, how we got there isn't the point. I sort of, that's behind the scenes to me. I'm not looking at it. It's how we use what we've got is what I'm looking at. And so I think um, that's a very different way of looking at professional identity is, well, how do I use what I've got to negotiate in this system? Um, and I think that that's been a very interesting way of looking at it because that for me, it's really about the disconnect. So you said, well, we know what we can do. I would say my data doesn't say that. I would say that I probably thought that from a personal point of view when I went in. I would say my data doesn't say we know what we do. And if we don't know what we do, and the organization is the one who's pushing the negotiation, and they don't know what we do, how are we aligning that? And so um, that's what I, I see in case A. 
case A is, I don't know what I do. The organization doesn't know what I do. So now I don't really, I just do things to keep myself busy, including filling out lab recs. And, and that's not helpful, right? And so there's a disconnect. Um, and so I'm hoping that that's what I'll be able to sort of bring a little bit to light. But thank you for your reflections. I think they were great. Thank you very much, Dorette. And thank you, Jennifer, for uh, sharing your thoughts. We're going to open this now to those of you who are attending. If you have specific questions for Jennifer based on her presentation, or if you have questions perhaps for Jennifer and Dorette to share in terms of their uh, experiences in primary care. If you are interested in asking a question, simply type it into the chat box that's provided on the GoToMeeting site, and Annalise will be moderating questions and will present them to our speakers. As you get your own thoughts together and think about the questions you'd like to pose to our uh, speakers, let me ask Jennifer a question to get things uh, rolling. So Jennifer, there's a lot of complexity to the work that you're doing, and at the foundation of it, some of us might simply think that what you're really talking about is nothing more than character differences. That there are some of us who are more assertive, some of us that are more passive, some of us that are more direct, some of us that are indirect. And is this ultimately, at the end of the day, simply nothing more than the, the individual personality of the the pharmacist who happens to be in that location. And the best thing that we can do is simply to advise everyone to put on their big boy pants or their big girl pants and uh, just basically man or woman up and for goodness sakes, just be a little bit more self-confident. So that's a very interesting question, which we have never talked about before. So I like it. Um, no, the, the healthcare system is a complex thing. Absolutely. And we should all be able to be successful in our role and provide value to the patient in the system, no matter what our personality is. Success shouldn't depend on personality in healthcare system. That's, that's not what a system is. Does a person, does specific personalities help? Yes. The same as they help some people. And so I will use an example of me. I hate intensive care never wanted to practice there because people don't talk and that's what I do really well. And so there, sure, there are things that you're going to have and not have, and there should be adaptability in roles. And that's not what I'm saying, because I think that there are different populations. If you're Dured and practicing at 410 Sherborne, which has got a highly underserviced GBLTQ, and then you're practicing in St. James Bay, which has uh, indigenous population, et cetera, you're gonna have different things that you should be delivering and the team should deal with that. But you shouldn't have to have a specific type of personality to be successful or contribute. And from a professional identity point of view, we should be able to access things in our past, either our experiences, our teaching, things that we can apply again in no matter what the situation is. And so um, do I think confidence is a really interesting thing. Um, it funnily enough didn't come out a lot in my data. I was surprised it came out a little bit, but not anything that as much as I thought it would. Um, and I think that there is some confidence and how we teach that or entrench it. Um, I will leave to some smarter PhD students than myself um, who have a big interest in that. But you shouldn't have to have a specific type of personality to be successful. Okay, thank you for that, Jennifer. Uh, Annalise informs you that we have quite a lot of uh, interest in your topic and lots of questions from uh, participants online. So Annalise, let me turn it over to you to start curating questions and uh, getting some response from Jennifer and Durrett. Over to you, Annalise. Great, thank you both, Jen and Dorette. Um, the first question, I think this is more directed to Jen, is from Margaret Jen online. She asks, what are some of the differences between case A and case B with respect to the experience of the pharmacist, academic versus community FHT, physician, young versus old, executive director, experience versus inexperience, um, and are there any other, pharma are there other pharmacists that case A or B is working with? 
Okay. So my cases, uh, just to give a little bit of an outview, I did both community family health teams and physician sponsored family health teams. Um, I have one academic family health team. Uh, so I'm actually not going to say which one that is because then it will break confidentiality. Um, the pharmacist in case A was more formally educated. So they had at least a residency and or a PharmD. Then the case B, case B um, had a bachelor's degree only um, and had practiced in community pharmacy before going into the family health team. Um, the executive directors were similar in experience. Um, both had come from healthcare settings, um, healthcare adjacent settings. Um, the, they were both single site and approximately the same size. Um, case A was in a bit of a bigger urban area though, and I don't have my, there's municipality grades and that's how I've looked at them. They were one grade above case B. So they were both very similar. Um, physician wise, case B's physicians were probably older based on the participants that I had. Um, so there are some differences, but for the most part, they were, they were fairly similar. <laughs> And they've both been practicing it. Um, everybody practiced more than in a fit more than three, they're fit more than three years, and most of them were averaging five or six, seven years in, in their fit. So that's great. Yeah. So the difference is um, some of this, and when we talk about when I talk about implementation of managerialism, some of this is what some people will deem team culture, right? Is is how do you change the, the things? Great, thanks, Jen. I'm gonna keep trucking along with co questions here just because we have lots online. Um, the next question is kind of related. It's from Sarah Gilcher. She asks, Hi, Jen, how does gender come, in, come into play with your research or future work? We know certain professions have gender influences as well as how different genders are socially socialized to negotiate. So that is a really good uh, question and is actually going to come out in my thesis as being something I should have paid more attention to in the beginning and will be looking into and signposting for future. So pharmacy is, um, as I said, the fit pharmacists are about 75% female and 25% male. Um, and so there absolutely could be a gender issue in the negotiation. I didn't look at it. Um, and that was probably some, I just didn't, I hadn't thought about it. And it actually came up after we did case A, um, going, ooh, should we have looked at this? Um, it definitely should be signposted for future. I think it really speaks to one of the points that Durrett made about socialization. Um, when I've looked at, it's been very interesting to do research as a pharmacist in primary care, in pharmacy and primary care. There's been a lot of things to look at. And one of the things, uh, that I have to do as a qualitative researcher is look at my sort of position and gender is one of the things that I, I need to look at a little bit deeper, but absolutely, I think probably signposted for future work. Fantastic. Jumping right along, we have a question from Della Croteau. Um, she says, for, for either or both of the speakers, how do you think we could develop that leadership and confidence in our pharmacy graduates? Right, do you want to weigh in first? <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, we both taught, we've both taught in the in the faculty, and um, I, I think in 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 my um, what I would I would want is I think we need to um, map more of our in our courses, map more of our objectives within the courses towards one of the AFPC outcomes, educational outcomes, which is um, leader manager. And if, if it's possible to embed some, some more or less sort of therapeutic, um, but a little bit more of the um, aspect of um, uh, leadership, that uh, course content into leadership, or maybe even co-curricular type of activities, 
um, that that could, you know, foster more of that ability. Um, I think I think that uh, that could be one way. I think the other way, and a big shout out to Naomi Steenhoff, who's doing lots of good education research and sort of along this, is we need to teach our students to be more comfortable with discomfort and ambiguity. I think that that really is um, one of the big, and this is a personal reflection, sort of, and not specific to my data, but one of the reasons I think that I'm able to move things forward and be confident is because I know that sometimes you make the right decision, the most right decision as you can. And then you find something out an hour later and you're like, eh, no, I would have changed that. Oh, but, um, and I think that having more skills-based learning around leadership, but as well as being comfortable with ambiguity and, and how to make decision-making and applying that in new, in new situations is, is essential. And I think, and shout out to Naomi who's doing that in her PhD. Um, I I think I would also like to add. I mean, I think now that we have the fourth year experiential program, um, you know, that is an opportunity within the fourth year experiential program to sort of um, model that um, leadership skill that you know we we can. Um, uh, allow the, the the students to make more mistakes but yet come to a decision and encourage them to make those decisions fantastic thank you both um we're going to do one more question before we wrap up um there are a number of questions that are still online so jen and Dorette, maybe i can just pass those along to you after the presentation sure. um just for some additional feedback and discussion um i would just love all questions just because it will be helpful to me as this is the first time I've sent this out there in the world. Yeah, lots here for you. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, just to close, I thought um, I'd, I'd read um, a comment from Lee Dupuy and then go into a, a fairly related question. So Lee says, personal agency may be a better focus for change than confidence. One tool may be our legislated scope of practice and the use of tools such as medical directives to expand our role. A big caveat is that implementation still requires cooperation, if not approval of physicians. So that, that was uh, quite interesting. And then a question from Nitya Sharma. She asks, what did you feel was the most common quality of pharmacists that negotiated their roles in a positive manner? So I think most of the, so in case A and B, and that's the data I have here, um, most of the time the successful negotiations really tapped into the, the organization's vision. And so this is where the pharmacist sort of was proactive in recognizing what their unique expertise brought to that organization's vision. And so they recognized that the pharmacist has this expertise. And I didn't present unique expertise here because it's just sort of coming out as a theme. I, this is a, an ongoing, <laughs> I theme things every day. Um, but unique expertise is one of the things, and this will tie into value, how we value things. So I could do lots of tasks in a family health team, but probably as the only pharmacist, Dorette as the only pharmacist is probably not the person who should be doing something that a pharmacist isn't uniquely qualified for. And so I think that the case B did some six very successful negotiations because they recognized their own unique expertise. I think they didn't know how to sort of navigate the negotiation as well as maybe other people would have, but what they did was they tapped into the structure. And so that's why I think that structure just supported the pharmacist being able to move things forward. Okay, thank you, Jen, and thank you, Dorette. This was a fascinating topic and clearly a topic that resonates with an audience. We actually had, I think, our largest ever CPE rounds audience for uh, this presentation. So thank you very much. And thank you to Annalise for organizing and for so ably uh, navigating us through the participant questions. 
Please join us next Thursday at this time for our next CPE rounds, which will feature Claudia Lai. In the meantime, thank you to everyone. I hope you are staying safe, well, and socially distant from one another. And if you are feeling lonely and want to interact with your colleagues more, we'll see you next Thursday at our rounds. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Dorette. We'll be signing off now. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.